Swanton is a busy agricultural and industrial community located just south of the Canadian border in Franklin County, Vermont. Surrounded by farms, wetlands, the Missisquoi River, and Lake Champlain, Swanton has close ties to the land, as well as to its history as a cultural crossroads. With a changing economy, and with nearby Chittenden County growing at a dramatic rate, Swanton now faces some of its greatest challenges and opportunities ever. The first human settlers arrived in the Swanton area before 9000 BC. As early as 6000 BC, ancestors of the Native American Abenaki tribe began living at a site now known as John's Bridge. For thousands of years, the ancient Abenakis inhabited the region, naming the river Missisquoi, a term meaning place of the flint. Missisquoi was an important region in prehistory, a crossroads between the trade routes in the south as far as the Caribbean and as far north as the tip of Labrador. The arrival of the Europeans in the 17th century drastically changed the region. England and France rivaled fiercely to colonize what would become the future state of Vermont. During the 17th and 18th centuries, present-day Franklin County was an integral part of an alliance between the local Abnakis and the colony of New France. The land had been claimed for the French crown in 1609 by explorer Samuel de Champlain. In 1723, the legendary Abnaki chief Greylock constructed a stockade fort to protect the Missisquoi Indian village. In 1734, King Louis XV issued a land grant that encompassed all of present-day Swanton. By 1740, the French had built the first European settlement in Vermont. The village of Taquahunga Falls soon featured a sawmill and a trading post. The French who came here in those days, they were not really settlers. They were more like explorers. They built a dam on the Missisquoi River by the name of Levasseur. It was the, the, the French guy who had a dam built there, the first dam built in Swan. By 1763, at the end of the French and Indian War, the settlement at Takuhunga Falls was firmly in British hands. Governor Benning Wentworth of New Hampshire officially chartered the town and renamed it after a British hero of the war, Captain William Swanton. Due to conflicting land grants issued by New Hampshire and New York, early Swanton was known by a variety of names including Prattsburg and New Rutland. Those would quickly prove to be temporary. As the Revolutionary War erupted, the towns located in the disputed territory between New Hampshire and New York banded together to form the Independent Republic of Vermont in 1777. In 1784, Ira Allen acquired more than 90% of Swanton's town shares from the original grantees and then had the town surveyed for the first time. Swanton's population began to grow and in 1790 the town government was officially established. In response to the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, President Thomas Jefferson declared a trade embargo on both Canada and England in 1807. Swanton's proximity to the Canadian border made the town a popular route for smuggling in the years leading up to the War of 1812. Throughout the first half of the 1800s, Swanton grew steadily in population. West Swanton, which would come to be known as Hog Island, was gradually settled by farmers. However, the Abnaki were forced into hiding, secretly keeping their beliefs and traditions intact. In 1837, Swanton's close ties to Quebec led many of its citizens to fight in Canada's own battle against British rule, known as the Patriots' War. With an abundance of mineral resources, Swanton quickly became home to a number of major quarrying operations. The Barney Marble Company opened in 1840 and still continues to produce a special red marble that's unique to Swanton. In 1877, the Swanton Lime Works opened and to this day is known for producing the purest lime in North America. Swanton's prime location on Lake Champlain made it a transportation hub for both shipping and railway lines. The Vermont Canada Railway began building in 1849 and Swanton's first railroad station was constructed on the west side of town in 1852. Other rail lines followed, including the Montreal and Vermont Junction in 1863, the Missisquoi Railroad in 1867, and the Portland-Ogdensburg Railroad in 1877. In the 1880s, the St. Johnsbury and Lamoille County Railroad built the paddle wheel steamer Maquam to ferry passengers across Lake Champlain. 
During the 1860s, Swanton began building up its downtown district called Merchant's Row. The block has since been beset by a number of devastating fires over the years, beginning with the fire of 1877. Swanton's village was officially incorporated as its own entity in 1888 to provide a municipal water system to the center of town. In 1901, the St. Albans and Swanton Traction Company started an electric trolley line, bringing workers from St. Albans to the Robin Hood Remington Ammunition Plant. In 1938, the Missisquoi Bay Bridge was completed, creating an important traffic route by joining the towns of Swanton and Alberg across Lake Champlain. Swanton has long sought to protect its natural resources. In 1942, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service created the Missisquoi Wildlife Refuge from 6,500 wetland acres. To celebrate the 350th anniversary of Samuel de Champlain's exploration of the region, the Swanton Summer Festival was organized in 1959. To this day, it's Swanton's most anticipated annual event. In 1959, it was the 350th anniversary of, of Lake Champlain, and the governor of the state said that he thought it would be nice if every town and village along the, along the lake would have some sort of a celebration. But that was fun being a part of that, uh, staying up half the night building floats, napkin floats, and uh, that would take about a week to do, and just gathering as people and going from, uh, from uh, site to site where the floats were and helping to stuff and and it was just fun. Ooh, summer festival, that's the biggest thing in Swanton. Um, every last weekend in July, I think, um, there's a bunch of rides and concession stands, and my friends and I always go up and see who can go the longest without getting sick on the rides. And it's usually me, because I never eat anything before. In 1963, to commemorate Swanton's charter from England, a pair of swans was given to the town as a gift from Queen Elizabeth II. Two swans, Sam and Betty, still reside on the village green today. In the first month of the 1970s, Swanton was hit by one of the worst disasters in its history, the downtown fire of 1970. One of my neighbors woke us up at quarter 11 and said, the town street is all on fire. I looked out my our bathroom, bathroom window and it just looked like, and I'm looking to the west, it looked just like the sunset. Sparks were going by our house. That's how strong the wind was blowing and it was spreading quite rapidly. The fire began in a store on Merchant's Row before midnight and soon encompassed the entire historic block. Strong winds caused the inferno to spread across the street destroying another block of buildings in the process. I had a, uh, a partnership of a small store down here in the square, and I can remember coming down the street with my wife, and it was all on fire, and I said to my wife, well, forget it, there goes our business. We hooked up garden hoses and uh, kept spraying uh, my grocery store all night long uh, to keep the sparks that were flying all over uh, from penetrating my building, and. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, I didn't lose my building. By the time the flames died down the following morning, Swanton's downtown district lay in smoldering ruins. This is a true story of my hometown where our business district was burned to the ground. They tell us that there were nine buildings involved with some uh, 14 businesses, and uh, we do know that there were 41 uh, individuals who lived in apartments over these businesses that have been displaced. Of course, uh, it was a sad day, you know, after the smoke cleared to go down and see the damage, you know, it was a regular funeral, you know, then, you know, it was, it was sad, yeah, very sad. During the 1970s, Swanton struggled to rebound from the devastating fire, rebuilding its business district in a modern style. The 1970 fire was not the last blaze to consume a historic part of Swanton. In 1987, the covered railway bridge over the Missisquoi River, the longest of its kind in the country, burned before dawn. I was awoken by the, uh, the crackling 
and the glow outside of my bedroom window and went down, just crossed the street, looked up the river, just in time to see the whole framework of the bridge falling into the river. It was a real eerie sight. Everything was a ball of fire and it dropped right into the river. So part of Swanton's history went right in the river. It was a sad day. The 1970s saw the revival of the Missisquoi Abnaki community, a people who had been in hiding for many years. In the early 1990s, the Abnaki began their annual heritage celebration, which moved to the Swanton Village Green in May of 2000. To this day, Swanton retains close ties to its past. A number of its historic buildings have been restored for present day use, including the Robin Hood Ammunition Factory, now an industrial complex, and the former Swanton High School, currently being renovated as housing for senior citizens. Recently, a group of citizens led by the Swanton Historical Society banded together to save the historic railway depot building, the last standing railway structure in town. The entire building was relocated across from the former site of the covered railroad bridge. On a day that was one day before our deadline, we were able to pick up that building, put it on the train, move it down the tracks, and get it to this location where we are hopefully going to restore it. I was amazed. I did go down that day, and they jacked and jacked and jacked and jacked until they got it to a certain point and put it on a couple flatbeds, and they pulled it up with an engine about a quarter of a mile. It was quite an operation, no damage. And it was really cool to see a whole building that was like 500 feet long in the air and on a railroad bed. I'm like, whoa. Today, Swanton remains a diverse, close-knit community that maintains strong ties to neighboring cities both north and south of the Canadian border. Nestled between rich farmland and an expansive wilderness area, Swanton has managed to retain a distinct rural character while facing new challenges for the 21st century. Swanton's proximity to Canada gives the town an international flair with strong cultural and economic influences from Quebec. Being in the northwest corner of Vermont uh, certainly has um, its advantages of uh, certainly being, uh, again, right on the border um, to uh, Canada. Um, certainly, I think, has provided uh, for us many tourists, um, you know, to come to the States. And certainly as they come into the States, uh, obviously one of the first communities uh, they come across is our community. It's a unique situation, I think, that you'll find very few places in the world. You listen to the officers here who have worked on the Mexican border. And this is heaven up here compared to that. So I, I think we've got a very unique situation, a common background. And remember, there is nowhere else in the world or in the United States that people have been able to immigrate to the United States and then go home for supper. Swanton features three distinct cultural groups, Anglo, French Canadian, and Abnaki. In recent years, the tribe has sought federal recognition a struggle which has intensified after the discovery that parts of Swanton cover ancient Abnaki burial grounds. In 1973, on this road, Monument Road, um, the Boucher family was digging for a cellar hole. While they were digging, um, the excavator had put a pile of dirt out of, a, out of the cellar hole and a skull rolled down. It was with that discovery, quite accidental, that we learned that uh, this was an extremely important and complex uh, burial site that contained uh, the remains of uh, several generations of Native Americans who had been placed there uh, from time to time under uh, different circumstances, but placed there with respect. And what was occurring, of course, was not an intentional, but an accidental, unintentional interruption of their resting place. I don't feel that we need federal recognition, but if, if that's going to stop um, all these uh, burials that are being dug up and going to give us our rights to hunt and fish and the rights that we're born with, then I guess that's what we have to do. When the Abenakis held their annual heritage celebration weekend, that in my lifetime we could see this being held 
right where we are filming this today, that it was held in downtown Swanton on the green speaks volumes to the change in the relationship. Because 20 years ago, I would suggest to you that the relationships were incredibly strained. Boom, all of a sudden people said, oh my gosh, we've got this whole ethnic group in here, this whole level of diversity that was basically unknown. Uh, it's not that the Anglo community here had really suppressed uh, the Abenaki in the last few years, really overtly, but the Abenaki just had to hide. And so it was just kind of bubbling under the surface. And when we had the powwow uh, a couple weeks ago, one of the most fascinating things, I was standing in one spot looking across Indian dancers at the Methodist Church in the post office. And I've been on that green, you know, all, and it just seeing this Indian experience with the, the town green and the post office right in the back, it just struck me. It's so amazing. Abenakis were feeling like they had returned back to some ground that they could connect with finally, and that they were welcomed. And that was a, an exciting feeling for them. And I think going in, they weren't sure that that was going to work out because there's some trepidation. So the downtown, as um, where the Abenaki feel about it, uh, it feels like they're, they're claiming uh, ownership. They're claiming some of the spirit back that they felt originally. I feel that we're all part of a greater whole, and I feel that we're all connected to a bigger one. And I guess I hope that for the Abenaki someday they all feel that way as well. With the Missisquoi River running directly through town and Lake Champlain a few miles to the west, Swanton enjoys a tremendous wealth of natural resources. The Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge and the Maquam Waterfowl Area feature world-class boating, fishing, duck hunting, and bird watching. The river is the point where life comes together, uh, where waterways intersect, such as that where the river intersects with the lake, you'll find the most wildlife in that location. And if a brook comes into a river, it's at that juncture that the wildlife congregates. And it's not unusual that, of course, uh, people, in fact, would congregate on the river because that was the place where animals would come down to drink and they could be taken by the hunters. Uh, that was the place where the fish were prolific and you could fish and capture uh, you know, sustenance for yourself and for your family. If you squint your eyes just enough and, and, and put your inner ear on, you can um, imagine it's a thousand years ago and people are fishing and living because that's what we're here on Earth to do. I guess I'd encourage people to, to learn uh, what this refuge is all about, why it's here, uh, try to appreciate the uh, the opportunities that it provides, both for wildlife, but also for people, and the value that it does have to the community. It's been recognized by uh, people for hundreds and thousands of years. And I think we can all kind of get along with things out here and continue to protect things and provide this habitat, and at the same time, enjoy it and use it. Swanton is one of the most productive dairy farming communities in New England. While Swanton's farms still thrive, economics and agribusiness have forced individual farms to expand substantially in order to survive. Uh, Franklin County is the largest dairy community in all of New England. And certainly, Swanton community has a number of farms um, that are part of a community and also part of our cooperative. And I would say that approximately in the range of 40 to 50 farms here in Swanton. And so they are, again, a very important part of our community and its heritage. Economics has taken the industry from the small family farm and being able to survive and, and raise a family on it to the larger farms. And uh, good or bad, um, that's where it's headed. And, and I think that it has brought farming um, to a level where uh, the farming um, industry 
and people need to understand how to survive in a whole new environment. We wanted to stay a family farm. We didn't want to bring in outside help, which meant it was David and I and Chris um, and our daughter-in-law, Kim. And it just, it was too much, seven days a week, 365 days of year, being here milking the cows as much as we loved it. We loved the independence. Um, we love bringing our children up here on the farm, being in the country, being near animals, uh, being able to work out in the fields, and we were looking forward to having it for our grandchildren too. And at the same time, mentally and physically, it was very hard on the adults day after day after day. Here in Swanton, um, a number of the farms have been preserved under the Vermont Land Trust. And I would say at this time we have somewhere near 30 farms that have conserved over 6,000 acres, meaning that that land will be used permanently for agriculture purposes. So again, as you go to the outskirts of the Swanton uh, village that you will see again, um, that I think will be prime ag land for years to come. We have some of the best uh, uh, farmlands in the, in the state and I think as long as, it, as there's dairy farming in the state of Vermont that it will thrive here in, in Swanton. <laughs> Industry in Swanton has expanded in recent years and the town has sought to attract new business that will enable future generations to work in the area. One of the things I still believe I'd like to see more of is industrial growth to provide some better jobs for our youth. Uh, we've got some great young people in this community who leave, my own youngsters included, for, for futures elsewhere because the benefits and the, the chances of opportunity are greater. I'd like to see more industry come into town, the kind that's not going to foul the air or the soil or the water or the lake or anything like that and just give people a chance to get a job that pays more than four fifty an hour. We have looked over the years to kind of diversify as the type of industry so we're not dependent on one certain type of industry. We've got um, industries really that uh, range from uh, the cheese factory, uh, have pharmaceutical companies and a printing company. So we, we've really come a long ways. Evan Spear for Channel 10. And I'm Ross Lavoie for Channel 10. We are here videotaping the Swanton Festival and some of the things you can do here, like uh, rides, bands, food, sh and shopping. <laughs> As in towns all over rural America, Swanton is searching for meaningful ways to involve its younger population in community life. They need something to do. There's nothing to do. People scream about them hanging out, but there's nothing for them to do. When I was a kid and I grew up in Connecticut, we had a teen center to go to. They need that here. The thing is, no one here, even me, I can say they need it, but who's going to do it? Where are we going to put this? Who's going to run it? There's no place for them to go. There is no teen center. I mean, it's nice to try to get places to open their doors up and try to get, you know, a, a spot for them to go to, but it's still not theirs. Mm -hmm. And I truly it? believe that the memorial building should be turned back over to the youth of Swanton, mm -hmm. the way it was years ago. There used to be a gym, uh, like when my father was a kid, Memorial Auditorium, and it had a basketball gym and they could play games and they could go there. It was like a, it was a place that was open all the time and it was open on weekends and it was, it had sports equipment and they could play all sorts of stuff and they, they need something like that. There was a bowling alley downstairs and that's where all the kids hung out and there are a lot of folks that would like to see that building returned for that use. Like I know Bob Hopkins was talk, talking about they want to get a teen center going. Something like that just so they have a place to go to do different things if they want to. There's a lot of talk of things they're going to do and things that are going to get grander in Swanton because they're going to revitalize the downtown. And if they do that, kids might stick around more. But if they don't, they're going to get out of here and very fast. I would have to say, when instead of looking at a kid with baggy pants and a hat backwards, thinking of them as being nobody and nothing, reach out to them. You know, say hi, wave, smile. It makes a big difference in their lives.
Wasn't it like about, weren't we supposed to be there about a half mile back? Uh, you know, I don't have the map. <laughs> well, okay, let's stop. Okay, we'll do a map check. I thought Ron had it. Surrounded by thousands of acres of preserved wilderness, with much of its open farmland now protected by the Vermont Land Trust, Swanton faces difficult decisions about where and how to grow. I worry right now that there isn't any real place to grow, and uh, we are going to grow, according to everything that I've been reading, and uh, grow a lot. I think there has to be a little more flexibility from zoning and planning, a little more, common, uh, more of a common sense approach to be able to utilize the existing space that's around here for, for business. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that common sense approach is, is used enough. You never had a car, did you? No. You never had a license to drive, no. did you? We're an older now. But you're driving all over town now. Yeah. And when did you start driving? Oh, about uh, three, four years back. I bought me one of them four wheelers. So you got yourself a motorized four-wheeler, yeah. and you drive around town every morning, I see yeah. you. What do you think about Swan? Good. You think you'd want to live anyplace else? No. And that's Swan is my only place I'll ever live. Situated at the crossroads of Interstate 89 and Route 78, Swanton's Village sits on the only major northern highway across Lake Champlain to New York State. Subsequently, Swanton faces a growing problem experienced in communities all over Vermont, heavy truck traffic. One cannot participate in making this film over a period of 10 days without realizing the impact of trucks. We're a main corridor for truck traffic from New York into Vermont. And as a consequence, tractor trailers pound our community every day. We have much higher than average truck traffic ratio than any other community, I believe, in the state. You know, we've got, we've got statistics that show that we get up to 1,500 trucks a day through this small village, which is a lot of, a lot of trucks. Truck traffic here is uh, enormous, and it goes right through the community. And uh, so that's Route 78. So Route 78 needs a big, uh, needs an improvement, along with the Missisquoi Bay Bridge. I would like to see the trucks have a more direct route from where they're coming to where they're going. They would be happier. They wouldn't have to suffer the inconvenience of gearing down, stopping, turning left or right, gearing up knowing that the community they're going through probably doesn't appreciate their presence. It must be awful for them. Bypasses, we talk about that, but uh, the state of Vermont basically has said not for a while. We're not going to see the bypass anyway in our lifetime, so we better deal with what's coming our way. One of these days is going to be a real calamity, and then they may do something about it. With Interstate 89 carrying many residents to work and shop in nearby Chittenden County, and with a number of longtime service businesses now closed, Swanton is working to revitalize its once thriving downtown. The downtown seemed to mesh quite nicely uh, back before the fire. And after the fire, of course, we rebuilt Merchants Row. And there, the, the architecture is kind of unique to the 70s, and you don't see a whole lot of it today. And it's my sense that downtown, the architecture, the old and the new, uh, just don't quite mesh. And uh, my perspective is that the stores, the whole, the whole scheme is just not quite as consumer friendly as it, as it could be. Some people have been critical of the decisions that were made. Some people say, gee, you should have replicated what we had, or you should have done something different. But I, I don't fault those people for doing what they did. Um, they had a crisis on their hands. They had to do the best they could with the information they had, the resources they had, and they did it. We went a little bit modern on it. We've been criticized for it, but on the other hand, well, maybe we did make a mistake. Maybe we should have rebuilt in the old, the old style. But the, the growth has been backward, really, because actually because of the big boxes, the stores. That plus the interstate, uh, the ease in which people can get from A to B 
where before it was a little different. There were the narrower roads, Route 7. Um, everybody has cars or they've got two or three cars in the family. So people are a lot more mobile now than they used to be. Um, people would walk down the street to do the shopping. Mothers would take the kids down with them in a wagon and haul the groceries home. Nobody does that anymore. One thing I've noticed is the decrease of, of businesses down the downtown area. You know, I can remember when we, when we had, you know, three grocery stores. We had a First National, an A&P, and then Prouties. And now we don't have any in the downtown area. We also had, uh, which you don't see today, is, is uh, an ice cream parlor. That was a pleasure just to go into and just sit around for a while and, and spend some time. I've heard a couple of um, feelings on this. Some of it say that it most certainly was due to the interstate and the ability of people and traffic to flow so freely in and out of town without necessarily stopping in town. Um, and I, I do think that, that that most certainly was part of it. And of course technology has a lot to do with it, but that is no different in Swanton than it is in any other community. And that's happening not just in the Swanton Village, but everywhere nationwide. What's happening with malls going on the outskirts, and malls, of course, are brand new entities that take open land and create something where huge parking lots, huge infrastructure where you put an awful lot of buildings together with the ability to go from building to building to building inside with a lot of bells and whistles for the customers, they attract an awful lot of the buying customers. And downtowns, which have been historical stores, ma and pa stores that provide services, they have a heck of a hard time to compete. We need to do something downtown to attract business. Uh, you know, catch your eye and, and say, uh, well, these are stores here and it's worth stopping here. I would like to see a, a good general store in that area with, with Vermont products and crafts and other uh, uh, other types of uh, uh, products that would be beneficial to the citizens of the uh, community as well as the uh, uh, tourists. Certainly we'll never have a supermarket again because there's just not the space or room anymore for that but I do think to to get the people downtown it's going to have to take some sort of a grocery operation and it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a uh, supermarket. It can be, uh, as I said, a, a, a rather large convenience store that would offer the basic needs to the people just to keep them downtown. Then if they should decide to buy their full big order or something, uh, they would probably still go to the larger supermarkets out of the village. But at least we'd have a, we'd have a traffic flow once again downtown if we could come up with some sort of a grocery operation there. Downtown is going to have to change with the population increase. If you want to keep your downtowns where you're going to have stores, you've got to have people. You've got to have numbers. And in order to hold this area numbers, you're going to have to have four and five story buildings. And that's the only way you can go that people can, you can't have a community on one ground level and expect to have the population great enough where they can walk to a store. You're going to have to go to elevated apartments. I think of a community, I think of it as like um, a person. They have uh, bad times, they have good times, they, um, they have times where they're poor, they have times when they're rich. And if you have uh, people in the community that care about this person, then they can feed it and make it better. Or they can ignore it and it can be neglected, but you can kind of bring it back to life. People are people, they all want the same thing, and that is happiness. I mean, I, that's something that I've found universal no matter where you go. And what is happiness? is being treated like you're special. And people will pay a premium to be treated special. So what we've got to do is find the niche that we can zero in, focus on, come up with either a theme or come up with an attraction. You can look to the past and see the future. If you can see what made Swanton great in the past, maybe they'll be great again in the future.
I would like to see more people in our community involved in what we're doing. I would like them to understand that they're welcome, that they're needed, that it isn't just a bunch of, um, you know, the same people doing the same thing, that they feel welcome, that they participate. I think right now we're kind of, our hands are tied in a lot of ways because I think we'd like to see a lot of things happen, but we just don't know what route to take to make it happen. And I think that's where the work has to begin. If you sit back and do nothing, you'll get nothing out of it. But if you give something, you're going to return from it, somewhere along the line. I don't think we appreciate everything that we have here. So maybe when they see the video, we'll get some more people get involved. <laughs> <laughs>